Okay, folks, uh, welcome back to the Climb Side Cast. And this is episode two, uh, talking about carbohydrates. And I'm with Brian from climbingnutrition.com. Hello. And myself, uh, Tom Herbert uh, from useful.coach. So, Brian, what is the plan for this evening? Today, we are going to talk about carbohydrates and how they fit into energy provision. Uh, seems like a natural next topic. We talked about protein last episode, and mm -hmm. we're planning on talking about other parts of the energy provision spectrum, such as fat and creatine phosphate in future episodes. But I think after protein, carbohydrates are probably the topic that most need to be discussed in the you know energy and nutrition world. Sure, sure. It's the next piece, basically. You know, we talked. We had protein was the building blocks, uh, predominantly, and now we're talking about the the first first bit of uh, of energy provision. So, Brian, do you want to give us uh, just a little outline of what we're going to cover uh, today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to cover carbohydrates like we talked, but specifically what we want to look at is why carbohydrates are unique in terms of energy provision. So last week we talked about protein and we talked about how protein isn't really an energy containing molecule. And that leads us with carbohydrates and fats. Well, what, what separates carbohydrates from fats? Why would you choose to eat carbohydrates and not a fat in a given situation? And of course, people's diets are going to be diverse. Someone eats an all carb or all fat diet, but you know, why specifically are we looking at carbohydrates and how are they going to help you with your climbing? If you choose them as a fuel over fat in a particular scenario. Sure. Uh, and then I think we're going to look at basically where, where we, where we're getting these carbohydrates from. So we're looking at stores. Um, we're going to touch, I think on really why people, some people have problems with the idea of, of uh, eating carbohydrates. Right. Yep. Cause just as important when we're talking about, you know, how carbohydrates are, are helpful. I think it's also important to talk about the, the often misperceptions people have about carbohydrates, uh, try to eliminate those so that maybe people feel a little bit better about consuming them. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the big things we want you to, you, the big takeaway from, from the chat today is really, um, one that don't be scared of of carbohydrates, uh, right? And uh, yeah, certainly we we want to just get rid of some of the myth mythology around them. Um, yeah. So the, yeah, on. and then after that, we're going to talk about some some of the practical aspects. Uh, so we're going to deal mostly with the science for the next uh, fifteen to twenty minutes or so, and then we're going to talk about the the putting into into practice what you specifically should be doing with carbohydrates. Sure. Sure. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we got some additional questions that were, were uh, uh, sent in to us. And uh, we're going to look, if we have time, we're going to look at a study that was recently uh, put out, which is a, a really fantastic review on um, uh, basically uh, what you should do as a boulderer, um, you know, nutrition, uh, nutrition wise. So right. starting from the top, so <clears throat> let's take it like this. So Brian, in a sense, how, well, let's, 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 answer, let's answer this question first. In terms of energy, one, what is energy in terms of, uh, of what is being provided uh, for muscle contraction um, and body processes? And also, how, how does this look or what does it look like or the requirements for a, uh, a boulderer and a sport climber, let's say, say because they, they, they are slightly different. Yeah, they are. Uh, but man, way to leave with a philosophical question. What is energy? Um, I mean, when we're talking about any biological process, energy is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's what powers our muscular contractions. And when we're talking about fuel choice, we're talking about, in this case, carbohydrates, which are going to be either metabolized through the citric acid cycle aerobically. So this is an oxygen dependent process, and that's going to provide the just the, the raw energy to resynthesize ATP from either ADP, 
or AMP, that's adenosine diphosphate or adenosine monophosphate, and allow you to keep working. But we're talking about biological energy. It's all ATP in the end. Yeah, and and, um, the, and just to, just for, for people who think this, this has already gone over their heads, what you can think about is ADP is basically a molecule, right? Um, uh, and it's called adenosine triphosphate because we've got this adenosine part and three phosphate groups attached. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the body does uses this as a molecule is that it can be controlled. This is a very, very small amount of energy. And the, what we're talking about, the energy, we're talking about the energy that's stored in the bond between these phosphates. And so we release this energy by cleaving off the terminal phosphate. Now, the, this is a minute amount of energy. This is like 10 to the minus 23 calories of energy in this molecule. So the reason we do this is so we don't basically explode. Uh, so uh, the, uh, yeah, this molecule, this ATP molecule, as Brian stated, is, is the, what is often called the currency, the energy currency of, this, of, of our body. It's what mm -hmm. all the energy that we derive from all the foods that we eat and the processes basically get bundled and recycled into. This is what we use right at the very cellular level to drive all the processes. Right. Yeah, it's it's the the base energy. Everything, whether it's carbohydrate, fat, protein, everything, or creatine, it just exists to replenish and regenerate that ATP. And then when we need to move, it's that ATP that's used. So if you imagine that you know you're climbing uh, and you have these these higher energy needs, you're breaking down ATP, the, the carbohydrates and the fats, they're not directly fueling you. It's an indirect process. Uh, it's not like you break apart a carbohydrate molecule and derive the energy from it, and that energy is used to directly power your muscles. Rather, it's just used to replenish the ATP, and the ATP is is always the bottom line. It's always what's being used. Yeah. So. so, so so again, so what you're looking at is we're we're taking that ATP molecule that's that's very unstable and is floating around in our cells, right? So there's adenosine with three trus, uh, three phosphates. We then snap off the end terminal phosphate and it becomes ADP, and right. it's that energy that's released. And then all the other stuff that that we are doing to generate energy, as you think in terms of nutrition, that is taking that free phosphate or a free phosphate and reattaching it back on to form ATP. So it's basically like a little rechargeable battery. We snip it off, that releases energy. We then do different things uh, physiologically, biochemistry, to attach that back on. And now we have that molecule to be used again. And this is what is the, the, the energy currency. This is this recycling back and forth between ADP and ATP. Right, and this is where you see the differences between how the different fuels perform. Because again, if we just use the energy directly from them, that would be one thing. Uh, they might all perform relatively equally at that point because we'd be talking about metabolizing them and just having energy stored within the molecule. But that's not what's happening. Instead, the molecules are being metabolized in different ways through different paths. Those paths have different lengths. The molecules themselves ha are, have different compositions. And that's where we get these tremendous differences in the capacity of one molecule to replenish ATP versus another one. Uh, so just very briefly to mention creatine phosphate, uh, we'll talk a lot more about it in a future episode, but right now, what is important to know is it's an extremely quick molecule. All you have to do is break that phosphate group off of the creatine and it releases energy. Uh, you know, the creatine moves from a higher energy state to a lower energy and that energy replenishes ATP. Requires just, you know, this the single enzyme, just the, the single reaction and it's extremely quick but we have a very limited store of creatine phosphate. So that's how creatine is special. Uh, carbohydrates are special because A, they're a very oxygen rich molecule. They've got it right in there. B, they can be processed without oxygen. So if you are in an oxygen free environment, uh, that's the wrong way to put it. I hope you're not climbing in space. <laughs> but if you have a limit of oxygen in your environment, whether it's because you're exercising hard or because your muscles are so so contracted, so flexed uh, that no blood is reaching them, then you can still use a part of that uh, carbohydrate molecule in order to power the exercise. 
And the third part of it is that carbohydrates relative to fats require fewer reactions in order to turn uh, using oxygen this time in order to take the oxygen and process the carbohydrate into energy to replenish that ATP. Right. So the three relative advantages, just quickly summarize them and then we'll talk about them a little bit in one by one. Number one, it's an oxygen rich molecule. Actually, let's say number one, it's anaerobic because that's a little easier to talk about. Number two, it's an oxygen rich molecule. Number three, it requires fewer reactions compared to aerobically metabolizing fat. Right. Now, and the reason that this is this is important to point out is because what you've got to think about is that if ATP is releasing energy, uh, we're going to need a lot of these ATPs releasing lots of energy, depending on the intensity of what we're doing. Um, now, when we talk about anything in sports, we could simplify it down to muscular contraction, right? if we're leaving aside things like the pumping of the heart and all that, but in terms of movement and generating what we need to do to do the sport of climbing, we're talking fundamentally about muscular contraction. Now, the, the, the degree of, the degree of ATP required depends on what you're doing. If if you're requiring a lot of power and strength in a short period of time, as in a maximal contraction as you're pulling, that requires a lot more, more ATP energy to fuel muscle contraction than say, uh, picking up uh, an ice cream cone and licking it, right? Uh, so this is where it matters or where it starts to indicate why carbohydrate uh, is used to produce the energy that is required because it is to do with the intensity of the exercise and the duration. Because as we do things for longer and longer periods of time, we will be not having the same intensity, or rather we can't have the same intensity. Um, uh, so so Brian, maybe Brian, I can, if I were to ask you a question, uh, in terms of an energy uh, provision, why is it that we can't sprint uh, a marathon well i well, think I that, think that I, and this, and is, this uh, is a, a little feedback on your end um okay it's gone sorry i think it's useful to look at atp in this case uh it's not it's this isn't i want to preface it these are fake numbers but they're fake numbers that i think are very useful to look at they're fake numbers because it would be impossible or at very least very challenging to look at what the actual ATP requirements are. Uh, it would vary by sport and uh, by the specific activity, by training status. So it's just, it's very impractical at the very least to actually look at real numbers. So let's use some fake numbers. And let's say that just like sitting down right here, right now, it takes, let's say 50 ATP a minute. It's it's a very different number. It would be, <laughs> that's not a real number again, but let's say it costs that much. So we have these energy systems and the aerobic system, we only have, we have a ceiling. We can only produce so much. We have a limited amount of oxygen to deliver and we have uh, a limited amount of fuel that we can you know run through at a specific time. So it caps at let's say 200 up to about so let's say i start walking and i'm using 100 atp per minute and then maybe i start jogging and that's my aerobic ceiling and that's 200. well what happens after that point that's our aerobic ceiling right there's no more energy that can comes from that thankfully we have these other energy sources we have carbohydrates and we have creatine phosphate and using those we can jack it up a little bit more but they're very small sources so why can't we sprint a marathon well, a marathon would take hours to run, uh, no matter how good you are. And you simply don't have the energy stores to sprint for that long. And that's that's ignoring whether you know, you're know you also gonna get some uh, uh, some excess hydrogen ion buildup. Uh, you know, as you continue exercising, you, you acidify the cells within the muscles and that will lead to fatigue. There's other reasons, but this isn't an episode about fatigue. This is about energy provision. And the bottom line here is, our energy sources that allow us to exercise above the aerobic threshold are extremely limited. 
they're very good for that high intensity stuff. If you're sprinting and you need 300 ATP per minute, then that's going to help you get to that number. And you wouldn't be able to get to that number without the anaerobic sources. But because they're so limited, you can only do it for a short period of time. Sure. And, and the, the way to sometimes think about it as well is that the, the, the limitation is, is, is basically the oxygen delivery. So if we were able to, to pump enough oxygen into our muscles at such high intensities, and keep the muscles saturated with, 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 with enough oxygen, then we would be theoretically able to use this, uh, what they call basically oxidative phosphorylation, this mm -hmm. creating energy from, with the use of oxygen. And it's a lot of energy, but we can't. And what's very interesting um, uh, is, Brian, let, let's talk about, so, okay, well, let, let's just do this quickly. So let us just address the the general idea of 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 where we're looking at in terms of the different times or durations and where the energy systems are going to kick in and do you want to just talk a little bit about why climbers specifically in four in their forearms why this is is it so specific to them in terms of this anaerobic um uh, energy provision uh yeah sure um i'd like to actually just touch briefly on something you said just a moment ago which is that, you know, talking about how oxygen is the limiting thing. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind when we talk about performance. Energy, the amount of energy you have, that is very rarely the limiting factor. We have virtually unlimited stores of fat and even carbohydrates. Like if we're talking about the glycogen we can store in our muscles, if we could 100% aerobically metabolize that glycogen, then that's again, that's like upwards of, it's over a thousand calories. It's upwards of 1500 or more, depending on what type of training you do and how many carbohydrates you consume. So that's, that's a lot of calories, but we don't have the oxygen to use them as efficiently as we can. And so we end up anaerobically burning a lot of those carbohydrates and then they must be replenished using oxygen at a later time. So oxygen is the limiting factor for when we're talking about performance. It's not fuel. And that's why oxygen becomes so critical for climbers in particular, I think. Uh, so you talked about, or you wanted me to mention how we use uh, when different energy systems kick in and why you know, oxygen is important in terms of like forearm vascularization. Um, I think, again, it's it's kind of deceptive to think about when different energy systems kick in. Uh, there's this idea that we're kind of passing the torch. It's it's almost like it's a relay race where, you know, you exercise for two seconds and you use only ATP because that's approximately how much free ATP we have to power high intensity contraction, two seconds worth. And then it passes on to creatine phosphate and we burn that for another five to 10 seconds. And then we pass on to anaerobic glycolysis, the breaking down the first step of the breakdown of the carbohydrate molecule, which releases a few ATP. And that then, you know, will power you for another 45 to seconds to a minute and a half. And finally you start burning aerobic uh, only if it lasts longer than a minute. I think that's kind of the wrong way to look about it because you're always going to be burning fuels aerobically, right? Yeah. If your body has oxygen, it's going to preferably use that oxygen to metabolize fuels. There's no point at which, even if you're at an all-out sprint and you, there's no way you can deliver enough oxygen, your body is still going to use 100% of the oxygen that is delivered. Right. So, yeah. But what happens is as you build up your intensity, and you can no longer supply enough oxygen, and you require so much more ATP than the aerobic system can actually produce for you, the percentage that the aerobic component starts to donate becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because you're getting so much energy from the anaerobic sources as well. So yeah, if you're running a marathon, again, to, use, to talk about marathons again, you're gonna use primarily the aerobic system because you're running out, you're usually going to be uh, right near the aerobic threshold. If you're a professional marathoner, you're probably going to be slightly above it. You 
done the training to make sure that you can endure an, an anaerobic, slightly anaerobic zone for a few hours. Um, but regardless, you're always going to be very near the anaer that anaerobic or aerobic threshold. You're going to be using a lot of oxygen. You're going to be using your all of it, and nearly all of your energy is going to come from these oxygen dependent processes. But if you're in a higher intensity, then you don't have that. So as you start ratcheting up the intensity, that's when you start seeing other systems kick in. So you have this baseline of aerobic metabolism is always happening. Until your body's free of oxygen, you're always going to be doing aerobic metabolism. And if your body does not have any oxygen in it, you're probably dead. <laughs> but as the intensity kicks up, you know, next you're gonna call into play some of this uh, anaerobic glycolysis. If the intensity is high enough, you're also going to be burning the creatine. And of course, this, this free ATP that you always have in your cells, that's what's being spent. It's not really an energy system. That's just that's just the little bit of currency you're holding on to and making sure that stays there. So to bring it back to the to the main point, I don't think it's quite fair to describe the way the energy systems work together as passing of a baton. It's not like you have, you know clear divisions where suddenly you're using carbohydrates anaerobically and suddenly you're using creatine and then you know you at a certain point after so many minutes you start using fat and you know aerobically burning carbohydrates you're doing all that at the same time but as your energy needs increase that's when you start to rely on other things so instead of it being a passing of the baton it's more like overlapping systems where you build upon it almost like uh you know a pyramid or overlapping you start with aerobic and then you start burning some, you start anaerobically processing carbohydrates. Um, and then you start using the creatine as well. And if you're using 100% of those systems at their max capacity, you're only gonna be able to hold that exercise for maybe 45 seconds. Right. But you know, if you're somewhere just slightly above that anaerobic threshold, then you might be able to hold it for a minute, or I mean, not a minute, an hour or longer, just depending on what your training status is. But you're always using all of them to a greater or lesser degree. There's never a point in which you're only using the aerobic system or only using anaerobic glycolysis. Sure, that's excellent. It really is a fuel mix. I think what's useful to think about is, remember the, bo the body really is just a, basically a bucket of, bucket of chemicals. We don't really have, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a feedback system and, and, and interactions between all these chemical molecules and things like that, that that is causing an up or down regulation of different things. So the fact that we're talking about here is, is the oxygen. When we don't have the oxygen, then we have more of these anaerobic energy provisions adding to the mix of energy that's required. And uh, as Brian said really nicely, is that it's, it's not a, a, one doesn't stop and the other one starts. They all are just merging. Um, right, they're all very, they're, they're intertwined in, in numerous ways. Uh, not only do you, you know, as you increase intensity, not only are you running out of oxygen, you don't have enough oxygen to do all of it, which itself is a signal that, you know, low oxygen is going to signal your body to start using more anaerobic sources. It's also just energy dependent. Your body knows approximately how much energy it needs to do a certain task. You know, you, you never accidentally jump twice as high as you meant to jump, it, you know. Your body has has an innate sense of what it needs, and if it knows that you're going to have these higher energy needs, it's that's also a signal to use these different systems. And there's probably a few other signals that I don't know about or that aren't important to talk about right here. But the point is, we have multiple things telling us this is what systems to use in this percentage, you know, roughly. And it's it's always changing, but we we can control it in that way. Okay, so Brian, so let's let's talk about this now in the nitty gritty. So let's talk about bouldering. So what? Why? Oh, well, no. Let, okay, let's because I wanted to break <laughs> to explain the the forearms because, because right. Okay, go yeah, go for that because that will explain a little bit well, more. Yeah, let's let's talk about the oxygen because I think that's the lead in here. Oxygen is a or the, the carbohydrates rather. A carbohydrates are an oxygen rich macronutrient. Fats in the, the fuel containing portion of their, the, their molecule, they contain zero oxygen molecules. Carbohydrates contain six oxygen molecules per 
six for, for carbohydrate that we oxidize. Now, if you remember, we just talked about how oxygen is the most limiting factor when it comes to performance. So when a molecule like carbohydrates brings oxygen to the table, that's an advantage right there. And that makes carbohydrates much more oxygen efficient. It relieves some of that oxygen burden. So even outside of the context of anaerobic, again, you know, carbohydrates can be burned anaerobically. It's a little bit of energy that's super useful when it comes to anaerobic things. But I would say that when we're talking about climbing and how carbohydrates help climbers, the even bigger picture is that carbohydrates contain oxygen, they bring oxygen to the table, and therefore we require less supplemental oxygen that we get through breathing in order to burn them. Now, you're probably thinking, climbing, it's, it's not like running where, you know, any, if, if you've ever run or done any aerobic activity, you, you get out of breath, your heart rate, you know, climbs way up, you're breathing really hard. Uh, if you finish a sprint, you're, you're basically breathing as hard as you can. That is, of course, the body's way of forcing you to inhale as much oxygen as you possibly can. Marathoners and ultra endurance or endurance athletes in general train really hard to increase what's called their VO2 max, which is essentially how much oxygen they can actually consume. Not the liver in this case. That's that's a function of like how many red blood cells you have, for example. Just consume, just breathe in and put into those red blood cells. Those aren't nearly as important to a climber. And when you finish climbing, most of the time, you're not out of breath. You're not breathing hard, doubled over, out of breath. So why are we actually talking about oxygen here? Why is oxygen important? And this is where climbing uh, becomes such an interesting sport because climbing relies so heavily on isometric contractions. Those are the contractions where you're not either you know shortening the muscle or lengthening it. You're just keeping it completely static. So you imagine that any time that you are, you know, gripping a hold and perhaps you're you're locking off, you're clipping perhaps, or it might just be a very slow pull through it, you have you you have essentially cut off oxygen flow to the muscle at that point. Um, there's no hard and fast number that we can apply to this. Uh, but when we're talking about maximal voluntary contraction, so essentially how hard you're clenching that muscle, it's estimated that maybe somewhere between 40 to 60%, you're cutting off basically all blood flow to that muscle. And the only way the oxygen gets to a muscle is through a blood. So no blood flow, no oxygen. And then if you have no further oxygen flow, what becomes super important? Oxygen. <laughs> At that point, you need to as efficiently use that oxygen as possible. And that's why carbohydrates are so powerful in the context of climbing. There's no type of climbing that doesn't rely on isometric holds. There's no type of climbing that doesn't require you to cut off blood flow to parts of your body, most frequently the forearms. And so the more you can eke out of the energy within those forearms, the, the longer you can climb not just in terms of how many hours you're going to be climbing for, but in terms of whether, you know, you make it to the next clip or to the top. We're talking about within minutes, you know, within the climb itself. Sure. So, I mean, any, anyone who's ever climbed knows, knows what a, like a forearm pump is. You know what's going on there. And that's not just the occlusion of blood there and the lack of oxygen, but it's part, part and parcel of how tight that muscle gets and how tight uh, the arm gets you can think about it, it's basically the oxygen delivery to the arm and to your grip strength is going to be diminished and this is why carbohydrates and uh, the phosphocreatine system right is so important here because as brian says is if there's oxygen is not able to get uh, to the forearms quick enough then the, we still have to maintain that energy output to hold on now one of right. the reasons that one of the reasons that you feel better when you do a shake is because you're actually shaking and allowing some of the blood vessels to relax. You're actually allowing some of the blood to return and uh, to leave, taking out things like hydrogen ions, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later in terms of the, the lactate. But, but this is why it's so key. And even just on this point should sell you carbohydrate. Carbohydrate can be burnt for energy without the presence of, of oxygen. And the harder you're climbing, and the more, let's say, pumped and more uh, 
uh, occluded your forearms are going to get. You're reliant on the, the best fuel source that can be burned for energy without oxygen present. Right. Now, again, it's kind of a double benefit there. I mean, not only can when your your forearms blocked off that oxygen delivery, not only can you burn the carbohydrates without oxygen and get ATP that way, but also, you know, there's a rel- there's some amount of oxygen trapped within those cells still. It's been delivered. It just hasn't been used yet. Let's use some more fake numbers and say that you've got 50, you know, atoms of oxygen within that muscle. And you can either use that oxygen to metabolize carbohydrates or you can metabolize it, use it to metabolize fat. And if you use it to metabolize fat, you get less bang for your buck out of that, those 50 molecules of oxygen. If you use that to metabolize carbohydrates, you get just a little bit more energy out of it. Right. And that's, so, that's critical. Yeah. So here's an interesting thing. So, so carbohydrate oxidation gives you about 10% more energy per liter of oxygen than fat oxidization. Right. Yeah. So what it means is, and we know this from running studies, is that basically that the that it means that using carbohydrate results in a lower demand for oxygen at a given running speed or power output. So if you're running at a certain speed with carbohydrate, or because we we'll talk about this just in terms of running, if you're running at a certain speed into, with uh, using carbohydrate for fuel, you'll be at a certain power output. If you were to keep the same power output but metabolize fat you need 10% more oxygen. This is why people who run marathons professionally eat a lot of carbohydrate because they have to maintain the power output so high and fat oxidation, though it's contributing to the mix as we we spoke to earlier, it's not- It's never 100%, one, 0% the other. Is that that ultimately carbohydrates will provide maximum amount of ATP in- without the presence of oxygen. Right. Now, just to touch on this briefly, and we'll talk about this in the episode when we talk about fat, but when you read a lot about things or read a lot of people talking about becoming better fat burners or becoming better fat adapted, what we're talking about <clears throat> is basically increasing the amount of fat that is utilized for uh, energy in the aerobic portion of energy provision. So right. we have this the only portion that fat can be used in. Exactly. So that's a, that's a very key point is you cannot burn fat without oxygen. So we have the initial energy supply without oxygen which is ATP, phosphocreatine and uh, carbohydrate in glycolysis. This is up to about 90 seconds of power output if we talk mm-hmm. about it. When we start going for longer or exercising or moving longer than that 90 90 seconds, more and more aerobic uh, um, energy provision starts entering into the mix. And when we talk about becoming more fat adapted, it's this where we start reducing the amount of carbohydrate that's used in this aerobic portion and increasing the fat. But the only reason that this is beneficial is because it means that you're saving the carbohydrate in so-called sparing it so that you can use it to produce more power output when you need, right? Where it becomes a little bit of a mess is that people can become so excited about the thought of using the endless amounts of body fat that you have to fuel your output. Forget, like I've just said, that you require you still require 10% more oxygen to use it. So right. someone who is fat adapted still requires, in a simple sense, to breathe harder to maintain the same output as somebody who was burning more carbohydrate. Right. And that's why, yeah, I mean, fat adaptation, it might be a valuable strategy for ultra endurance athletes, people who don't want to carry fuel with them, right? Because carbohydrate, you have a very limited pool. You couldn't run a hundred miles on the carbohydrates you store in your body, unless you become, unless you either provide an outside source, which means carrying food with you, which I'm sure they do. Um, they, They must, or, becoming more fat adapted to the point that you can just draw on your fat and only use carbohydrates to, to do it a little bit. But there's there's no performance advantage when it comes to fat adaptation because there's no performance advantage of fats relative to carbohydrates in the aerobic system. It's very challenging to increase how much oxygen you can consume. You can increase your VO2 max, but that has a hard cap on it at some point. And once you're there, you're never going to be able to increase it by another 10%. 
And even if you did increase by another 10%, carbohydrates still have the oxygen in the molecule and they're still going to be more efficient. So there's never going to be a point in which if you become more fat adapted, you're going to gain a performance advantage. At best, you're going to save yourself the hassle of carrying some fuels with you. But if it's a shorter exercise or a shorter climb or a shorter type of exercise, then there's just there's no real advantage to the fat over the carbohydrates in this sense. Yeah, what, what, what we're not saying, though, is there, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit more in, a, in another episode. There is, there is an, a notion of being meta, metabolically flexible. And that, what that means is that at the right time, you're using the right fuel. So you, what you want to be doing is that right now, so listening to this podcast, if you're not doing anything uh, much, is that you predominantly want to be burning fat, right? This is a very efficient way of, uh, of util utilizing energy, not to mention it, it aids in body composition, right? You want, to, you want to burn fat. But when you want to be, do power output, you want to be burning carbohydrate. And what's very interesting is that we know from studies that the people who have become keto or fat adapted what they have become unadapted to do is burn more carbohydrate. So you can go one on the other side, meaning that you become such a good fat burner that when you require carbohydrate burning, you actually don't. And the reason for that is, is that your body has actually down-regulated the uh, enzymes that burn carbohydrate. So you actually become a poor carbohydrate burner at the expense of becoming a good fat burner. Now, right. it doesn't matter if you're running ultra marathons because it's a different type of event. If we go back to our point here, the only reason that you would want to be a better fat burner uh, as a climber would be in just a general sense of aerobic fitness, meaning that during the times when you're in, you're wanting to recover, you want fat to become part of the recovery uh, provision in terms of this soup of uh, energy systems coming in but that's going to happen anyway um uh, uh in yeah. terms of, yeah so we don't go too far because we're already half an hour in um uh, we'll talk about fat adaption and ketogenic ketogenic diets and all that in a totally separate podcast but brian right, let's, too go, big to cover here. Let's, yeah, let's go back let's talk about glycogen now um because this is really where we're getting our, our let's talk about glycogen and sure. exonogous ex, exonogous well, Awesome. Let me close the topic on oxygen with just one other thought, a quick thought there, um, which is um, some of you might have heard of EPOC or post-exercise oxygen consumption. Excellent point, yeah. Basically, whenever we do anaerobic exercise, we build an oxygen debt because ultimately all that anaerobic fuel that we use, it has to be replenished using the aerobic system. Uh, if we you know, burn phosphocreatine, if we break those down into creatine, then they're going to be regenerated and they're going to be regenerated using the aerobic system. They can't be done that in the moment. So we have to wait until after exercise. Same thing with any, uh, any carbohydrates, any glucose that we've broken down into lactate and exported out of the cell to be replenished in the liver. It's going to be replenished back into glucose or regenerated back into glucose using oxygen. So after exercise, you have this, this post exercise oxygen debt. It can take hours to even sometimes days to fully recover. Um, and again, the more oxygen efficient you are, the quicker you can recover it. So it may be not terribly important uh, if you're just talking about the context of training and you know, just going climbing once a day or you know a few days a week. But if you're competing or if you're trying to get the most out of like a, a day <laughs> at a crag, then being able to recover as quick as possible you know, cut, cut short that, that oxygen in debt after exercise, then the better off you are. So again, carbohydrates, more oxygen efficient, just allow you to do that quicker. Another way that if you are just climbing and you want to most out of your day, they're going to help you recover faster. Okay. So let's move on from oxygen now. I think, <laughs> I think hopefully everyone understands why carbohydrates are so great oxygen wise. Um, let's talk about, yeah, glycogen. So unlike fat, which we store in uh, you know, a specific tissue, we got near virtually unlimited stores of it in our adipose tissue, carbohydrates have to be stored within the muscle in a form called muscular glycogen. We also have a small store in our liver, liver glycogen. Liver glycogen can be exported to anywhere in the body. Basically, once a glucose is broken off that glycogen molecule, it is released into the bloodstream and any, it's up for grabs to whatever system 
has dibs on it. If glycogen is in a cell, on the other hand, it cannot leave that cell. So any glycogen stored in a cell must stay there. So when we're talking about glycogen, you know, trying to optimize glycogen stores for climbers, there's only really one way to do that, and that is through climbing, because what you want is good glycogen stores within the muscles that are important for climbing. Having huge glycogen stores in your legs is worthless. It's actually less than worthless for a climber because glycogen is going to increase the weight of your legs and not going to provide anything for yeah. your climbing. But if you're increasing glycogen within your forearms, then that's great because your forearms, again, they, they're a they're very small muscles, so you have a very limited capacity. Uh, so the greater you can kick it up, the better. And B, they're just so often going to be deoxygenated that you want as much anaerobic fuel as possible. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, so, so in terms of, uh, uh, that would bring me to the point of, of just weight. So glycogen is chains, long chains of glucose molecules. It's similar to what starch is in vegetables. So uh, when we store glycogen, we also store it along with uh, roughly three grams of water. Right. So per gram of glycogen stored, we store three grams of water, which is exactly why if you uh, are weighing yourself and you go and have a really big pizza and, you know, a lot of carby food, the next morning you can change weight quite dramatically. Um, yeah. This is also why if you... you know, go on a very low carbohydrate diet, why it can appear as if you've lost five to 10 pounds in the first week. Exactly. You've exactly. gotten rid of your glycogen stores and therefore you've gotten rid of a ton of water. Sure. It's not, it's not the weight loss you want though. Yeah, water, water flux is, is important. And I think um, as well, and I uh, would we'll just briefly say this, is that if you're a climber and you're thinking that you want to shift weight quickly before a competition, and you think that, well, the easiest way to do that is for me to, to limit my carbohydrate. Uh, no doubt, you can. I can see you drop two and a half kilos in a couple of days. The problem is now is that you now don't have that, guy, that, that carbohydrate store, which, which, which we've just pointed out is so important. Uh, right. You've lost your fuel. So that's going to certainly affect your performance strongly. Um, you know, if you've only lost the glycogen weight from your upper body, it's it's not even going to be like a, a serious weight loss necessarily. It's not going to be enough to increase your performance. And that water weight, you know, it's easy to view it as kind of pointless, like it doesn't serve a purpose at all. But water is a great heat sink. And when you lose that water weight, you're losing water out of your muscles and they become less good at holding on, at, at absorbing the heat. And so it's it's actually much easier to succumb to uh, heat fatigue as well. So there's a, a practical purpose to all that water as well. Sure. I mean, everybody knows that you should stay hydrated, but apparently right. by reducing water in your muscles, by reducing glycogen is a good idea. Yeah. Water, what, is, what is hydration? It's, it's, it's keeping, it's, it's not, it's not just some loose idea of water in the body. It's specifically water where it needs to be and water needs to be in your muscle cells and in your blood. Sure. So, I mean, we're looking at, right, for the average climber or for the average human, right, we're looking at about 300 to, to up to 600 grams. If you're a bodybuilder or something, you can push that up to seven or 800 grams. But for yeah, an average um, climber, we're looking at about three, 300 to 400 grams of glycogen in the body. And we're looking at about 100 grams of glycogen that's in the liver. Now, the right. liver glycogen is predominantly there to maintain your blood glucose. So... Uh, when, when, uh, you, uh, for instance, overnight or when you're not consuming any food, uh, your blood, your blood has to be maintained. Your blood glucose has to be maintained. And that's primarily what the, the, um, the glucose or the glycogen in your liver is, is providing. Uh, yeah, your it's a buffer. yeah, your muscle glycogen, as Brian said, can't be released. So, uh, this, this does play into, into the fact that if you've been eating a huge amount of carbohydrate, and you haven't been doing any climbing, then no doubt you don't necessarily need the same amount of carbohydrate uh, before the next climb as you would if you were climbing really hard and eating a low carbohydrate diet. So glycogen in the muscle is used locally. Um, so for instance, if you were just climbing with one arm, then this arm, the left arm is not going to be glycogen depleted as much as the right arm. Right. But here, I think there is an, uh, kind of an interesting addendum, which is you know, it can be kind of demoralizing to think, well, 
you know, you can only store so much glycogen in your forearms, maybe about 20 grams, um, you know, in each arm, probably less than that, 10 to 15 in each one. That's, that's not a lot. And, you, you know, maybe you've got, you've got all this glycogen kind of locked away in parts of your body, your upper body that are going to be used, but they're not going to be used. They're not going to be taxed nearly as much as your forearms. So it can be demoralizing to think, well, I've got, you know, way more glycogen in my lats than I have in my forearms. And they're not going to go through all of it. So, you know, what what purpose is that really serving? Uh, but the interesting thing about glycogen is once you anaerobically burn it, this drove all glucose, it, it becomes a glucose molecule and then becomes pyruvate and eventually it's reduced to lactate in when you're, you know, doing anaerobic exercise like climbing. And that lactate can leave the cell. And after a particular climb, it'll be converted by the, you know, when you're in a rest period anyway, not like a five second rest on a hold, but like you're down from the wall and you're resting, then that lactate will be regenerated in the liver through the Cori cycle. It'll become glucose again, re-enter circulation where it can be used by the forearms. So even though glycogen is trapped within the muscle, it's not like it, it'll never see any other cell ever again. It just needs to leave it as, as lactate essentially. Right. But since climbing is a high intensity, it's an anaerobic exercise, we can guarantee that that will be happening during and after every single climb. The body will automatically replenish muscles that need the glucose from the muscles that were kind of burning it just because it was a anaerobic portion. Right, right. Okay, so uh, before I want to talk about um, next is um, carbohydrate coming in from the diet and what's going on with that. But just to give some people some idea of, of usage. So now we don't really have any papers that talk about how much glycogen you use during a climb. Um, but I found a couple of papers that, re that were related to um, resistance training, right? So, Vincent, we can see that, uh, well, let's just give you one here. So apparently in this one study, we've got three sets of bicep curls to failure that reduced the muscle glycogen in the arms uh, to 25%. Right. So we could say that if you were doing really hard, hard training or climbing, you might be reducing your upper body glycogen uh, to about 30 percent or something. Um, and we'll give you some figures of what of really what needs to then be eaten to replenish that. And this is the big thing. You, you'll be surprised. It's actually not that much. But let's that now that let's lead us to um, uh, uh, eating well, let's talk about dietary carbohydrate. Um, and let's, Brian, let's do, let's go quickly. Let's talk about <laughs> what actually happens um, when we consume carbohydrate um, and uh, why some people might be scared of, of, of consuming carbohydrate. Sure. Well, I think there are, I, there's, there's probably a few more reasons, but I think most of them probably hinge on one of four reasons of why they believe carbohydrates are unhealthy. Um, there's an idea that carbohydrates themselves are a cause of insulin resistance. There's a belief that sugar, uh, so we're talking about like simple sugars here, uh, specifically fructose is dangerous. There's an idea that carbohydrates are innately more fattening than fats or other macronutrients. And there's a belief that carbs can be inflammatory. So which one would you like to start with, Tom? Let's, okay, let's start with, um, okay, let's just start with what actually happens if we were to consume, uh, let's talk about, okay, let's consume, I've just consumed 60 grams of, um, of, I don't know, carbohydrate in the form of bread or something. Okay. So what's going on? Mostly glucose. What's going on? Yeah. So what happens? Let's let's talk about. Or do you want me to 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 talk? Maybe I'll do that. Yeah. Lead in. Lead in. <laughs> okay. So if we're talking about, so what happens basically is glucose can be absorbed. So fundamentally, carbohydrate in the form of what we of starches and things like that are chains of glucose molecules, right? Uh, without too much detail, what we're doing in digestion is that we're breaking these long chains down into the fundamental point, which is the glucose. And the glucose is what we use um, uh, in uh, um, glycolysis and aerobic uh, oxidative phosphorylation, things like that. 
that's what we actually yeah need. glucose that's the fuel for that's the carbohydrate fuel every other fuel just gets turned into glucose in one way or another exactly every so other glucose, carb fuel yeah so when we talk about carbohydrates as fuel we're fundamentally talking about the glucose molecule right so that's what it is glycogen is the way that we store these glucose molecules we join them yep. together and we snip them off and then we use them for fuel uh we can absorb um, in the gut glucose um, at a rate of about one gram per minute. So we can roughly do about 60 grams an hour. This is actually a cap. We can't really go much higher than this. This is why you'll see people who consume too much of those uh, sugary gels and carbohydrates and things like that uh, end up throwing up or getting a really bad stomach because we can't actually push it out. What's interesting though, just briefly, is that the glucose molecule uses one transporter called a sodium transporter to get through the gut into the bloodstream. Fructose uses a different uh, glucose transporter. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is why when, uh, when runners use a specific sports drink, they will have a mix between fructose and glucose so that both of these transporters can be used at the same time, which delivers more carbohydrate to them quicker. Again, right. the reason that we want to deliver more carbohydrate quicker is so that we can burn this much more energy providing fuel with less oxygen. Um, right. The, uh, where was I going with this? When we consume, when we consume glucose and it enters our bloodstream and our, and our blood uh, levels start increasing, uh, a hormone gets released or as it passes through the pancreas, a hormone gets released called insulin, which you would have heard by now. If you haven't, it's amazing. Is <laughs> the, the fact, and then insulin's job is basically fundamentally to switch the body from utilizing uh, fatty acids for fuel to be utilizing um, um, uh, glucose for fuel. And the other fundamental thing it does is it stops the liver from producing or releasing glucose, and it stops the fat cells from releasing fatty acids. And why is that the case? Because you've got glucose coming into the system, right? Right. What people forget is, well, not forget, but maybe they don't know, is that Carbohydrate, the consumption of carbohydrate upregulates the metabolism or the burning of carbohydrate. Interesting enough, consuming fat doesn't do the same thing. But by consuming carbohydrate, you switch the body to use carbohydrate. When you're not consuming carbohydrate or not consuming any food, your body uses the liver or the liver releases glucose from, uh, releases glucose to keep the blood glucose levels normal and then fat is released from the fatty from, from the adipose tissue to then fuel processes right um, yeah very simple terms you know we're talking about insulin versus glucagon insulin is an anabolic hormone it helps to push the glucose to the cells that needs to be glucagon uh you know so it's it's storing it in one way or another or you know at the very least getting it into the cell where it in the in the context of insulin will usually be stored um, and then glucagon is kind of the, the opposed hormone, which is going to tell cells to release it, um, most specifically help the liver to release glucose from the glycogen back into the bloodstream. So insulin's an anabolic hormone. Uh, glucagon is this catabolic hormone. We need the insulin to push the, the glucose into cells because without insulin, the glucose can't go anywhere. You know, all these cells, they have these uh these glucose transporters lying beneath the surface glucose cannot bind with those transporters until they reach the surface and insulin is what tells those transporters to you know break the surface so that glucose can get into the cell yeah so now, insulin now we, it's, it's a good thing yeah now what we do is we'll talk we'll talk more specifically about insulin and hormones and, and carbohydrates when we talk about uh, on a podcast specifically about dieting I think that's going to be more useful. But mm -hmm. uh, let's have a look. I'm just scrolling through my so the notes here because I'm just wary of time for the listeners. Sure. Uh, let us. Uh, okay. Um, well, let's let's maybe let just uh, let me let me touch on this uh, this idea of of insulin resistance and whether carbs okay. can actually influence that. Since we're talking about insulin, uh, it seems like a good time. Um, so carbohydrates trigger insulin release, right? So why, you know, th there's kind of like the base question, which is why if carbohydrates trigger the release of a hormone, would they also trigger 
the resistance to that hormone. And this is where I think people don't really understand where insulin resistance stems from. Insulin resistance, it, it doesn't stem from having too many carbohydrates. Uh, too many carbohydrates can, in the case of like somebody that's diabetic, pre-diabetic, and can trigger so much insulin release that the pancreas starts to not be able to produce it as well. And that's you know where diabetes can develop, type 2 diabetes. But carbohydrates themselves do not cause the resistance. And it's the resistance that really drives that pancreas to keep wanting to create more and more and more insulin just so it can get through it. So what does cause that insulin resistance? Uh, there's kind of there's two things. Number one is as your body uh, develops more fat cells and grows more fat cells, fat cells have insulin receptors to, uh, so that you can you know, put the glucose into them if the case requires it and store it as fat. But if, every, if you became obese and every single one of those fat cells had insulin receptors, it would be very easy to accidentally shock your body into a hypoglycemic state because all those fat cells with all those insulin receptors would suck the glucose out of your blood. So as a defense mechanism, as you start to gain weight, gain fat specifically, the body starts down-regulating the appearance of insulin receptors in the fat cells. Uh, so that's, that's the first way. Um, as you gain weight, you have fewer insulin receptors within the fat cells. And then the second one, is that, again, it happens as you start gaining weight, specifically gaining fat, the muscle cells start becoming filled with these metabolites, these fat metabolites called diacylglycerols. And those in a quirk of biochemistry actually prevent the insulin receptor, or rather the, the GLUT4 transporter within the cell from making its way to the surface. So you still have the same number of insulin receptors. They just don't work as effectively because something within the cell is preventing the transporter from making its way out. But again, this is caused by an excess of fatty acid metabolites within the cell, which only happens as you start to gain weight. Now, there's certainly some uh, you know, physiological oddities, metabolic conditions, uh, genetic disorders that are going to change what this is. But in general, the only way that a normal healthy person become, can become insulin resistant is by gaining weight, specifically gaining fat, at which point your body starts naturally becoming more resistant to insulin. The interesting thing with the, the, the fat specific in the muscles is that when you exercise, you convert those fatty acid metabolites into a form that no longer blocks the, the GLU4 transporter from making its way to the surface. And that's why when you when we have these studies of uh, exercise, the effects of exercise on in insulin resistant individuals, without fail, we see an improvement in insulin resistance. Actually, a little quick inter interlude on that is um, so Brian picked up on this GLUT4 uh, uh, transporter. So insulin triggers this GLUT4 uh, transporter to to translocate so that it can then move the glucose in to the cell. What's very interesting as well is muscle contraction in itself will also cause these GLUT4 transporters without the need for insulin. So this right. is why exercise um, is prescribed to people with uh, um, metabolic syndromes and things, because merely by using muscle, you actually cause the muscle to take in glucose from the blood um, without the need of uh, insulin to be present. Um, right, which is important because insulin is not present except in high amounts except after a meal. And if you're exercising, it's often not after a meal. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's, shall we say, uh, do you want to say something about why carbs are not fattening? Can you do that? In yeah. Uh, this is one of my favorite myths because uh, it's got a very scary term attached to it, de novo lipogenesis, uh, which you hear that and you're like, oh, man. Carbs are, you know, they, they cause this process called de novo lipogenesis. Uh, de novo lipogenesis is, it's just a scientific term for new fat creation, which that by itself doesn't really maybe sound any less scary. But think about what's happening. If you consume a very, if you consume too many for calories in the form of carbohydrates, or if you consume too many calories in the form of fat. In the case of fat, it's already in the form that you can store it as. So you just take that fat molecule. It might require slight processing to convert it to a form that a form of fat that our body wants to store. But other than that, you can store it. You don't have to create any new fat molecules. 
de novo lipogenesis is required for carbohydrates because carbohydrates are not fats. And so we need to make them into fats. And that's what de novo lipogenesis is. It's turning, it's making new fat molecules out of carbohydrates. That doesn't mean that carbohydrates are, are more fattening than fat. In fact, it actually means somewhat the, the opposite because it takes energy to turn carbohydrates into fats. Fats can already be stored. If you consume you know, 1,000 calories in excess of what your needs are in the form of fat, you can easily store all 1,000 of them. You don't need it. It's, it's minimal processing. If you store, if you consume 1,000 extra carb calories, you have to turn all 1,000 of those into fat calories in order to store them. So that, that has an energetic cost. That's why we, we have uh, some studies that show that if you forcibly overfeed people, well, I shouldn't say forcibly, but if you have a study where people are, uh, the, the, the study parameters are that they're over consuming calories in either carbohydrates or fats, people who over consume cal carbohydrate calories typically gain slightly less fat than people who over consume fat calories. Now, I want to say that like practical implications of this is is not really this isn't saying that oh fats are, are less or carbs are less fattening than fats because I would say that the bottom line we should all keep in mind is you shouldn't be over consuming calories. There's no healthy way to over consume calories, uh, except for in some very specific instances. Uh, if you are routinely over consuming calories, regardless of whether the carbohydrates or fats, that's not a healthy road to go down. So. When I say that you can, you know, consume more carbohydrates and gain less fat, this isn't an encouragement for you to go do that. It's just saying that there's there's no real advantage to fat over carbohydrates when it comes to fat storage, and the the fears over de, de novo lipogenesis are really overblown and don't make any sense when you actually break down what's happening. Yeah, and so this is the this is the thing is is one. When you consume carbohydrates, your body upregulates the burning of carbohydrates for fuel and the storage of fat. The process of de novo lipogenesis is costly to the body. There is no reason that the body is going to turn your carbohydrates into fat if you're right. consuming fats in the meal. It will shuttle the fat and it will use the carbohydrates until they're gone. Right, exactly. <clears throat> the what is we've done studies on on this, right? Um, and to get someone to start producing a significant amount of fat from carbohydrate is intense. There was a paper done in 1988, which is one of the most famous ones. They had to feed these guys uh, 1,000 grams of carbohydrate per day for I think four or five days to basically absolutely saturate their glycogen stores, right? 1,000 grams of carbohydrate is a lot. Uh, three cups of cooked rice is not even 150 grams of carbohydrate. Right, it's so, uh, a thousand is is very challenging to consume. Yeah. So what they did is they basically overfed these guys until the point that the body could not store any more glycogen. And what was amazing is that they actually calculated that once the glycogen stores are basically full, the body can still deal with five hundred extra grams of glycogen, right? Of oh, sorry, of carbohydrate coming in, meaning that it would mm. oxidize that before it would start turning or really start turning this extra energy coming in into fat. And this is the fundamental thing. It's the extra energy. The body can't just hold on to this energy, right? So it has to do something with it. And that's why if you were to overfeed yourself with a thousand grams of carbohydrate every single day for a week, you will start producing fat from that. Uh, funny enough, you will actually upregulate up your metabolism to deal with the carbohydrate and it can go twofold higher which we see in studies. Mm -hmm. So you actually end up burning more carbohydrate than you were before. But once you reach a peak where the point is that your body cannot handle any more energy coming in, it has to convert it into a safe form. And that's when body fat comes in. So what I'm saying to you and what Brian would agree with, it is almost impossible. And I really mean this. It is almost impossible for any of you listening to turn carbohydrates into fat because right. you, because Unless you are, uh, and I don't mean this to any offense, is unless you are uh, in the category of being uh, uh, obese or morbidly obese and are unable to actually do any uh, um, physical exercise and your diet is hypercaloric, 
the fat that you consume in your diet will be shuttled to fat. The carbohydrate that you're, you're eating will be, will be burnt into the point where you cannot handle any more energy coming in. And then it may be turned into fat. But in the study that I talked about, these guys had to consume, uh, once they'd hit saturation, they were consuming an extra 500 grams of carbohydrate on top of that. And they were basically producing about 100 grams of, of lipid. What I'm saying is that it is really, it is near impossible for you to produce uh, fat out of um, right. carbohydrate. It Fructose just doesn't happen nearly as much as you think. Uh, and that kind of, I think, ties in with this whole fear of of sugar and fructose, which I, I think I heard you just saying, which is kind of, it's the same idea. Um, there, there was, uh, I think about five years ago, a very popular idea, which is that fructose causes this uh, condition, non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome. Um, because fructose, uh, if you know anything about its metabolism, basically our, our muscles, they, it's not that they cannot use it, but they're, they're it, practically speaking, they never will. So fructose will 100% be metabolized by the liver. Uh, and if you overwhelm your liver's ability to metabolize it, then it turns it into fat and the storage location for that fat is going to be this uh, padding the organs, this uh, abdominal or visceral fat, which is a very metabolically unhealthy type of fat. But again, this only happens in some extreme circumstances. So if you look at what the, the metabolic fate of fructose is, then this is, this is kind of the order of operations. This is what's going to happen from the most likely thing to happen to the least likely. And number one is that fructose is actually going to be converted by the liver into glucose and released into circulation. So it's just a, a simple little metabolic switch, transform the fuel type, and now it can be released. Uh, it's never stored as glycogen, it's just converted. The second thing that happens is it's going to try to replenish the liver glycogen. So the, the liver actually, the enzymes that create liver glycogen prefer fructose as a fuel over glucose. So if there's glucose available in fructose, the body, the liver will use as much glucose, fructose as possible to turn into liver glycogen, sparing the glucose, which can be used by the brain and muscles and everything else, as opposed to the, 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 the fructose. So that's the second thing that happens. The third thing, and this, now we're starting to get into the realm where it's like, this does not, this isn't too common, but the fructose will be converted into uh, acetyl-CoA and used just straight for energy. So acetyl-CoA will be run through the, the citric acid, or it will be a, a, a feeder for the citric acid cycle, aerobic energy production, and uh, the liver derives energy from this process. And finally, and only in the circumstance that the body doesn't want any more glucose in circulation, it's already got too much. The, the liver has no glycogen, it, it has no more need for it, um, and that the liver has no need for energy. When all three of those have been exhausted, then it, they'll take the liver will take that acetyl-CoA, and instead of using it for energy, it'll use it as a precursor to make fat. Does not happen, except for in extreme energy excess. So fructose, uh, you know, again, this, is, this isn't an argument to go out and eat as much simple sugar as possible. Uh, you know, we're, we're, that's not what Tom and I are talking about here. We're talking about the myths surrounding it. And the myth here is that fructose is inherently dangerous. Your dietary choices can certainly make fructose. Uh, you can certainly consume too much in your diet. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about like if you're getting fructose from otherwise healthy sources or limiting your consumption of unhealthy sources of fructose and you're consuming calories in moderation, you're not going to ever encounter any danger from fructose itself because fructose itself, its metabolic fate is not dangerous except for in these extreme circumstances where you're already making unhealthy dietary decisions. Great. Let's talk. So the next thing I think people people worry about, and this is thrown around a lot, is that carbohydrate is somehow pro-inflammatory. Right. I think um, this was your favorite one. Yeah. Now this this is an interesting thing, right? Because I I went out of my way. I literally went out of my way because this is a big question I've always had. Is everyone talks about this? Like there's so many books that talk about how carbohydrates are are inflammatory, and I actually cannot find data on this. If anyone has the data on it, then show it. There is a difference <laughs> where 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 the data comes in to say that carbohydrates 
are inflammatory are the studies where they look at people who are consuming basically junky food, right? We're talking about refined carbohydrates. We're talking, talking about high levels of sugar in the diet. Um, we're talking about a diet which is basically providing nothing to be anti-inflammatory. The fix for someone who is in a pro-inflammatory pro condition or having a pro-inflammatory diet is to eat an anti-inflammatory diet, which we're talking about things like um, high vegetable content type of Mediterranean diet, right? Uh, uh, what is interesting, right, is that the amount of studies that I came across that talk about how one of the reasons why you should be consuming carbohydrates after your training sessions is because they are anti-inflammatory. They are immune modulators. And one of the, 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 the problems with, with um, athletes who are consuming a chronically low carbohydrate diet and training incredibly hard is that they actually impact their immune system's ability to deal with um, these inflammatory markers. So there is more data to show that carbohydrate intake is anti-inflammatory and can aid with recovery and help uh, specifically when you're doing things like overreaching, like incredibly hard training camps. Carbohydrate intake is then is critical because it actually supports your immune system and it support, supports the anti-inflammatory processes. It's not in, it is not in, uh, it's not inflammatory in that sense. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, here it's it's important to note, like, what, what are we actually talking about when we talk about inflammation and carbohydrates being inflammatory? Because yeah. inflammation takes so many different forms in the body, uh, and the way we measure it uh, can make a, a big difference. And if you ask somebody specifically, like, how, if you consume this slice of bread or, you know, the sweet potato or whatever, how exactly is it going to cause inflammation in the body? Then the argument breaks apart because there's no specific inflammation that you can point to that's happening. The only areas that you can point to are you might be able to look at some uh, inflammatory biomarkers and certainly anything you eat is going to have some small effect on them. Um, but is it a greater or lesser effect than if you had protein or fat in place of that? Maybe, maybe not. Um, does a diet that has carbohydrates in general cause this, this kind of widespread inflammation? There's just, there's no evidence of that. Uh, inflammation, I think, is just this, this boogeyman that we have now. And carbohydrates are one of the, one of this boogeyman's henchmen. There's a there's a few other you know red meat milk people have ideas about what causes inflammation and what doesn't it's just this hot topic right now but there's there's simply no no evidence that carbohydrates themselves are inflammatory I think and what we do unhealthy is diets sure we can point that unhealthy diets can certainly cause some uh, inflammatory disorders down the line but that's the the key here is that the diet has to be unhealthy it doesn't just have to have carbohydrates yeah i think we should do it i think we should do a show on on basically uh eating for health or eating to yeah. uh inflammation eating rec for recovery i think we'll we'll do a whole show, whole show a whole show on that uh, do you want to just quickly mention why for instance low carb diets are, are sometimes talked about for being uh, anti-inflammatory yeah again i think it, it has to do with the the like what's the context that most people begin a low carbohydrate diet um usually their diet most likely is going to be unhealthy to begin with uh they might be overweight so when we're talking about like who adopts a low carb diet and who benefits from it we're usually talking about unhealthy individuals to begin with replacing unhealthy foods in their diet with healthier foods uh so in this case maybe they're taking unhealthy sources of carbohydrates that they're consuming in excess and replacing them with healthier fat based foods it, it, you will certainly see uh, some reduction in inflammation from that but you could take that same diet and replace the unhealthy carbohydrate sources with healthy carbohydrate sources and see just as much if not more improvement um, again you know we're talking about the it's a bigger picture here it's about the diet it's not about specific uh, it's not about this this one specific macronutrient Right. And uh, one of the one of the big things to realize is that losing weight is one of the most health promoting things. 
Absolutely. Your adipose tissue is extremely inflammatory. And when you have excess amounts of it, it releases a lot of these inflammatory biomarkers and inflammatory uh, molecules. So if you reduce the amount of visceral fat you have, this this kind of central fat, then you're going to reduce inflammation in the entire body. Yep. Yep. Okay. So let us move on now to actually some application for you guys. So... <clears throat> I, I, in my notes here, I, I divided into what I thought was some of the, the, the main things that we, we would look at. So what I've got here is basically some general guidelines um, on what daily carbohydrate intake you should go for. I've got uh, a little guideline for periodized carbohydrate intake. So this would be if you have a training block or something. Uh, I've got a carbohydrate uh, days before an event. So that would be like a project or something. So leading up to that, and then I've got um, uh, carbohydrate intake on the day of a, of, a, of an event. So either doing the project or competition. Um, so now again, with, with these conversations between me and Brian, we don't sit and use the same notes. So a lot of this stuff is we've done it in such a way that that we have a discussion, um, and we're coming it from from our own investigations. So uh, what I'll do is let me. I'll let me go through what I what I put in my notes, Brian, and then maybe you can you can chime in what you think. Um, yeah, sounds good. So we looked at earlier about what how much glycogen you could potentially reduce after doing a climbing or a uh, uh, a training session, right? So theoretically, maybe you could reduce your your glycogen down by between twenty and forty percent. What's interesting, right, is that you're looking at roughly, and I, I've used a 65 kilo climber as a, as a kind of a, 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 a marker here. If, if we're saying that someone climbs in the afternoon and has had a, a hard training session, you're roughly going to need about three grams per kilogram of your body weight to recover what you lost in that training session. That's not much. We're looking at about 200 grams of carbohydrate for a 65 kilo climber, right? Obviously, uh, depending on the on how strenuous your training was, that may go up and down. But in theory, you're looking at like just over three cups of cooked rice, or yeah, you know, if you're going to do that. But I mean, you can eat anything. You, anything that's sugary, right, is going to provide that more or less. Um, mm -hmm. When I took this is I, just post. This is just for yeah. the post exercise glycogen recovery. Though we're not talking about the context of an entire day. No. So how much you should have this is you exercise how much do you need to return your glycogen levels to your pre-exercise state yeah that's and roughly 200 grams is going to be a good thing for oh sorry three grams per kilogram body weight the, the daily intake right so what i've got here is basically between five to seven grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight so we're looking at about 300 to 500 grams of carbohydrate per day for a 65 kilo climber so obviously that factors in the 200 after the session. So, you know, if you're going, say you're going for the upper limit there of 500 grams a day, then, you know, you only need another two, 300 leading up to your training and then 200, 200 afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what I would rec recommend for someone. So five to seven grams per kilogram per day is what I would call for moderate to high intensity climbing training, right? If you, right. have a day, if you have a day that's low intensity or say skill-based like fingerboarding, mobility, yoga, then I'm saying go for a lower end. So that's three to five grams per kilogram per day. So that's about 200 to 300 grams. So mm -hmm. when this is the interesting thing, right? Is that as soon as you talk about eating carbohydrate to anybody, people suddenly assume that you're talking about a high carbohydrate diet, right? We're talking... I'm talking here for the for a heavier climber, roughly 500 grams of carbohydrates a day. That's the top end. I see no reason why no that a, a an average climber who's climbing, let's say, three or four times a week, cannot get away with eating about 300 grams of carbohydrate per day. Right. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily take a lot, and I think the type of climber that you are primarily is going to influence that as well. Uh, so boulders are going to need overall less carbohydrate just because they're going to be so reliant on different on the the much faster creatine phosphate system 
spore climbers, and they're also not going to be necessarily dipping into their glycogen as much. Um, spore climbers who are going to be on the wall for minutes at a time, they really need considerably more carbohydrate just because they want to maximize those glycogen stores. And if we're talking about, you know, in addition to training, what affects how much glycogen you store, it's also how much carbohydrate you eat. So if you have a diet that's 40% carbohydrate, you're going to store relatively less glycogen if you have the same training schedule as if you consume a diet that's 75% carbohydrate. Uh, so if your goal is glycogen supercompensation, getting as much as possible, then increase your carbohydrate content. But you don't need that necessarily, depending on the type of climbing you are. Um, I often divide it down instead of doing grams per kilogram per day. I'll, I'll talk about like what percentage of the calories in your diet should come from carbohydrates. And I would say that most climbers should be somewhere in the range of 40 to 75% of carbohydrate calories in their diet. Again, 40% is for the lower, the lower end, uh, for boulders, people who are just doing these very quick sprint things and probably aren't going to be on the wall for longer than maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds at the most. And a sport climber maybe is going to be more in the realm of 55%. And, and then when we start talking about these really long multi-pitch routes, things that are going to take a better portion of your day, if not days, then glycogen and storing as much glycogen as possible, that becomes uh, significantly more important because – Again, also, return to intensity very briefly. If you're climbing for hours and hours a day, it's not going to be by nature. It's not going to be nearly as high intensity as if the problem that you're working on is, you know, if you performed it perfectly, took only 25 seconds. Those are different intensities. And the, the relatively lower intensity of long multi-pitch routes tells us that you can actually get maybe a little bit more benefit from a higher carbohydrate intake. Yeah. So, but but whether you want to look at it forty to seventy five percent or five to seven grams per kilogram, they work out to be about the same thing. It's uh, often for most climbers, we're talking about three hundred to five hundred, maybe six hundred if you're a particularly large climber doing particularly long routes. But uh, three hundred to six hundred or so, three hundred to five hundred. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the other thing as well is that so during your training session or your climbing session. Uh, both of us would probably recommend that within about, about about an hour or 75 minutes of your of your your climbing, it's worthwhile uh, having 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate. Um, mm -hmm. We've we, carbohydrate uh, has been shown. Well, the amount of the amount of data that we has that carbohydrate improves performance is overwhelming. So it's, yeah, we it's, it's, we've got that, tons of data on that. Yeah, what we do know is that. Um, Carbo consuming carbohydrate uh, during your training or climbing session is going to improve workload. Um, there's a nice study I found talking about CrossFit athletes. Now, CrossFit is incredibly glycolytic work, very high intensity. And what they actually discovered is that uh, the, the group of, of CrossFitters that were consuming five grams of, uh, five grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body mass um, performed less work than a group that was given eight grams per kilogram of of body mass, uh, and they were talking about 15 or 16 reps difference. Now, obviously, wow. with, with CrossFit, uh, they are doing repetitions for time, um, and by just increasing their daily carbohydrate intake by two grams per kilogram, uh, they increase their repetition range by uh, 15 reps. That's substantial, right? What, what we know is that carbohydrate during intermittent uh, 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 exercise can uh, uh, not only provide um, uh, a better focus uh, and better mental clarity on the task, um, it, it also improves uh, even the excitability or the membrane potential on the muscles so that you can actually uh, contract muscles quicker. It's basically a performance improver. Um, what this doesn't mean, though, is that you have to chug huge amounts of carbohydrate down like a, uh, a runner would do. You're, you're not spending that much time. But certainly, if you're doing, uh, say, uh, three hours of training in a day, and that's going to be interspaced, then consuming at least consuming six, 60 grams of carbohydrate uh, between, you know, every one and a half hours is going to be worthwhile. Um, yeah, it, I think it depends on exactly what you said. Uh, it's how long are you going to be exercising for and how hard. If you're 
just going in. Maybe you have just a little bit of time during lunch. You're going to head to the gym, do 45 minutes of climbing. Uh, I mean, I you might be eating lunch anyway, so it might be kind of a <laughs> redundant, but you don't need carbohydrate for that short of a session. You're going to have enough glycogen most likely to get you all the way through it. But if you're going to spend a three-hour training session, you will definitely benefit from getting some carbohydrate during it. Um, I would usually recommend 45 to 60 grams per hour if it's of a relatively normal to high intensity. If it's if it's just light fingerboarding or something, you know, if you're not using a lot of muscle, you're just kind of doing more skill focused maybe or using the just smaller muscle groups, then maybe you can get away with less than that. But the longer you work out for, the more important these uh, what we call exogenous carbohydrate sources become because your endogenous sources are so limited that if you tax them by taking a long time or by doing extremely hard work, you run out of it. And that's when your performance is going to decrease. Yeah, exactly. But I, one thing I, I find, so one of the, the my favorite things I give to uh, uh, people who are my, my clients is I often ask them to take uh, biscuits into the gym with them. And uh, almost every person I've ever said to basically eat one biscuit as soon as they're feeling fatigued improves their work uh th work their work uh volume over the train of the space mm -hmm. of the gym session right and it literally is we're talking about 15 grams of carbohydrate in a biscuit can improve for instance your deadlift right because yeah. it will stimulate and what is what is interesting about carbohydrate is you actually don't even have to eat it so what they've done is recently they've done studies where they looked at swilling carbohydrate around in the mouth for cyclists and then spitting it out. And the mouth has receptors, basically glucose receptors, uh, that will pick that up and actually signal to the brain uh, that there is uh, either glucose coming in or it will excite the brain. We're not fully sure why it happens, but what we do know is that what they call carbohydrate mouth rinses can improve performance quite substantially. Um, this right. could be useful for uh, a climber during competition uh, once they, if they didn't feel like consuming more carbohydrate between um, uh, uh, problems, um, literally just having a sugary drink or a sugary sweet in their mouth, uh, just swilling that around before they, they jump on the wall could benefit them. It basically will just, the, the brain will, uh, will infer that there's something coming, something happening and, and you'll have that on board. I would not yeah. recommend doing it in place of carbohydrate in terms of ingesting it, but it's something to play with, and certainly if you're yeah. doing, if you're if you're dieting or you're very restricting calories and you don't want to have another dose of of a carbohydrate, then certainly yeah, sucking on a on a, on a candy or something could actually uh, improve your performance. Yeah, I would say my my take on it is I think it's a little bit more the the idea of carbohydrate switching is a little bit more interesting kind of hypothetically uh, than it is maybe a practical remedy because ultimately. If you want to increase your performance, we know that consuming carbohydrates will do that. We know that just getting them into your belly is is the number one way to improve, improve your performance with carbohydrates. And I think that now that we know that we have these signals in our mouth and that sugar or glucose is going to trigger them, even if you don't swallow it, it's interesting that that is most likely a part of this performance increase. But is it worth just swishing them in most contexts and you know spitting it out and not actually consuming those carbohydrates? Well, I mean, if you swish them, you're not going to get any of the energy out of them, obviously. So ultimately, I think you get more benefit if you don't just swish, but swallow as well. Sure. There's, yeah. I mean, but like Tom said, maybe in a weight loss context or, or some, some context that you really don't want to be consuming extra calories for some reason then perhaps there is some benefit to be gained out of this. Yeah, um, like maybe, like maybe gut distress, but this is a very, very low chance. So right. that takes me to, um, so what I talked about is maybe periodization. And this is a very simple thing. So we're looking at, say you were doing, you wanted to pick, block out two, two weeks of really intense training uh, for like a, for a project. Then what I would probably do is up your carbohydrates. And we know this because uh, um, uh, there's been studies done on training camps where they've really overreached these guys and and they were consuming basically between seven and ten kilograms, I said seven and ten grams of carbohydrate per day. Now, as a climber, maybe you don't need 10 grams, but certainly what I would do is I'd put on, put in more carbohydrates uh, on those really intense training sessions. Because like right. I said, it will support not only the workload, 
but actually uh, uh, reduces the overreach, overreaching um, uh, symptoms. So reduction in, in performance is less profound, training volume is increased, and there's better recovery. So carbohydrates are pro-recovery, and you need to need to understand that. I have one little footnote, which maybe uh, either Brian or myself will do an article on, is there's a little, uh, there's experimentation now with what they call uh, restricting carbohydrates. Uh, in my case, the only one I think which would benefit climbers was what they call train high, sleep low. Um, and all this is doing is that you would consume all your carbohydrates that you would want uh, and during your session so that you can do the maximal work uh, output that you can and the quality of work during your training or climbing. But after your training session, you would not consume any carbohydrates whatsoever and then basically go to bed. And the, and the thought behind this is that basically by not providing the glucose post-training, you can upregulate some of these um, uh, endurance adaptations. Um, uh, it, the, 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 the data is there, whether it is actually improving people's performance the data doesn't really say yet. Um, yeah, it's something to that you could experiment with. What I wouldn't do though is uh, is well, the main thing is I'd be careful with restricting carbohydrates to the detriment of uh, your health. So this may be something that you could play around with, where you're doing maybe a block of endurance type training, and you could throw in a couple of these um, a, a week. But whether the benefit is there, I can't say. Uh, certainly with this sort of stuff, you can experiment. If you're feeling like you get a cold or your immune system feels like you're being taxed, then, yeah, you need to start putting carbohydrates post-session to recover. Um, yeah, I think this is, yeah, it's it's really kind of a young topic right now. Um, I haven't heard of the train high, sleep low. I've heard of a different one, which is basically that you want to uh, maybe train every like a couple couple sessions every month in a glycogen depleted state um there it seems like there's probably a few ways that people have tried approaching this the bottom line though is that in no case are we talking about overall total carbohydrate restriction for a long period of time because if you recall earlier in our discussion we talked about how all that's going to do is it's going to downregulate the enzymes that help you process carbohydrates and metabolize them so you don't get any real benefit to that um, the goal behind any of these methods is you're trying to train the body to burn fat, in this case, more efficiently without affecting carbohydrate consumption or carbohydrate processing at all. And that requires a very delicate touch. Uh, you, you can't restrict carbohydrates carte blanche. You really have to be very specific about it and do it only on rare occasions. Yeah. Now, now I know because there's probably people screaming at, at, the, at the podcast saying that, well, we know so-and-so climber who eats a low carbohydrate diet and is, you know, kick ass. I know that I've spoken to them, you know, that we will address ketogenic diets and whether or not this works. And we will even have some of the climbers who do low carbohydrate diet um, on the podcast as guests later on. So we're not, yes. we're not denying that this doesn't exist, but we're just saying that well, you've listened to this podcast, you understand, you should by now understand why carbohydrates are not right. only beneficial, but they are essential. Um, okay, so the next next thing I've got here is basically uh, the carbohydrate intake on the um, day of a project or a competition. And to be honest, it really doesn't change that much than your standard. Uh, leading up to competition or leading up to a big project, consuming a little bit more carbohydrates, so in that range of maybe seven to 10 leading up to that mm -hmm. the reason being is that you have a say some days of recovery or you're doing light skill-based training you're going to increase your carbohydrates so that by the time you get to your competition or your um your project uh you're going to be basically you're topped off with glycogen you're full etc um so when we're on the day of the competition or something nothing really changes that much uh you take the car you can have your carbohydrate uh ready um, to have during your 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 competitions, so that's normally you know thirty to sixty grams with five hundred mils of of liquid. Uh, what I didn't mention earlier is that uh, the inclusion of caffeine has been shown to augment glycogen recovery. Plus, caffeine, if you handle it well, uh, improves performance. So you know having um, uh, a a sports drink and a cup of coffee is not a bad bad way of recovering between competitions. 
uh, consume right. carbohydrate just before, like an hour before the event. So what I would normally say is that you're going to look for like three to four grams of carbohydrate per kilogram, three to four hours away from the event. And then one to two grams of, per kilogram of carbohydrate about one hour before the event. So we're looking at like 200 grams leading up to the event and then 60 grams just before. Um, right. One, one big caveat I've said with all this, and I'll, I'll let you talk, Brian, is that what I've said here is climbers must experiment with carb types, amounts, timing, meal combinations, so that's carbohydrate, protein, and fat, supplements, split, sports drinks, gels, well before the events. So yes. you must have a, before you go into a competition, right, or before you're, you're tackling a big project, you have to have decided upon and practiced your feeding strategies. And this is essential because you yes, mitigate, essential. mitigate any uh, uh, gastro in, uh, problems or performance per. So all of these guidelines that we give you, right, these are numbers that we're giving you. But what we're saying is that experiment with what we've given you. And certainly, certainly, and I really mean this, don't choose something that is novel on the day of an event or day of a competition. Have something that is in place. Practice your carbohydrate or rather practice your eating strategies in uh, in climbs so that you know that on the day of your competition, these are the foods that I normally eat. These are the amounts I normally eat. This is when I eat it and I feel fantastic and my performance is going to be good. Right. Yeah. Everything has to be, you know, we, we can give you the details of what works for most people, but you have to try everything yourself. The last thing you want is to be going into a big competition that you're psyched about and have gut rumblings. No, you know, that's just, not only is it unpleasant, but it's going to affect your performance on the wall. So you need to know that the foods that you're eating are not going to give you any gut issues. And uh, you need to try to tailor what you're eating to, to give you the best experience. Ideally, when we're talking about competitions, regardless of the type of athlete, uh, it's usually recommended to try to actually perform on a near empty stomach. So we're talking about eating solid foods, uh, stopping eating the solid foods at least two hours out, if not four hours. And then after that point, shifting to liquid ones, just because it'll be so much easier processed. Um, but again, this, this, it's, a, it's very personal. Uh, I've worked with athletes and they do not like competing hungry and that affects their performance. So it's, it's worse for them to compete hungry than it is to compete than the benefit they gain from competing on an empty stomach. So be aware of what affects you. And you can know, practice, you, you, know, you know, hypothetically speaking, that it's your performance will be at its peak if you're performing on an empty stomach, just because you're not gonna have any energy going to digestion. But that hypothetical point is trumped every time by your own personal experience. So do what, do find out what works for you. Yeah. But in general, I would say, Cut out the, you know, eat some very slow digesting, very fibrous foods. Uh, stop those at least four hours before the competition. Um, at least two hours before, if you're eating solid foods, they should be relatively simple. Uh, so in this case, we're actually talking about processed carbs, like mm -hmm. crackers and breads. And then an hour or so before, liquid only and through the competition, unless it happens to be a very long competition, probably liquid only. Have a, have a sports drink available that you can sip on. Um, something that is going to provide you with roughly 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour is 45 to 60 is probably enough for most climbing competition uh, situations. And also keep in mind that not only is this beneficial for the competition itself, but uh, you know, assuming that you do well in the competition, there's often multiple days. So you know, there, there's preliminaries and then there's semifinals and finals. So you're, you're going to need to recover in between and Consuming carbohydrates can help you with that if you're consuming it during the competition as well as before. But know your body and know what works for you. Practice beforehand. Yeah, and that's really key. You know, if you're doing multiple events, then you need to make sure that your your post uh, competition or your post training um, carbohydrate intake is going to fulfill that needs, which you know we mentioned earlier. And also, so th the fact that you know you might not want to eat so much on the day of the event should put onus on you to make sure that the, the days leading up to the event are carbohydrate rich so that you can top off your glycogen levels uh, going into competition. So you can 
spend more time eating higher amounts of carbohydrate leading up to the day of the event. And then on the day of the event, you're just topping up uh, a little bit so that you feel motivated. Um, right. now, now I've got a little interesting bit here. Um, uh, and I should do a book recommendation. There's, uh, uh, maybe I'll do that in the notes. Um, but uh, there's a, the, um, what's interesting is that uh, women during their menstrual, menstrual cycle will actually utilize carbohydrates and fats differently. Um, whether this actually impacts performance to such a degree is debatable, but there is some data on this. Um, and basically what we're looking at is that during the uh, first and the last weeks of uh, the menstrual cycle or the phases, um, you're, you, the physiologically you're similar to men because you're in a low hormone uh, position. But during the first two weeks of the follicular phase, your estrogen is actually increasing. And this is actually a point where your carbohydrate usage is much higher, meaning that you're actually more glycolytic. You can actually derive more power, or sorry, more energy out of carbohydrate. So during the first two weeks of, of, of your menses, this is actually where you're probably going to get the most work. And this is where you can eat a lot of carbohydrate and get really power and quality and train hard. Uh, when you start going into the, um, uh, the luteal phase, um, you, you're now switching from estri high estrogen to high progesterone. And what's interesting is that you actually start switching to, to use less carbohydrate and increase fat usage. Um, and what this tends to happen is that for people who are doing power uh, sports, this is not such a great thing because you can't actually tap into your glycogen stores to, to the same degree. Where it is beneficial, though, which which is interesting, is that for people who are doing long endurance events, like over 90 minutes, this luteal phase is actually not bad because you end up using uh, fat better. But this is just an, as an aside uh, for women, is that if you're, if you're um, which you probably already know, is in terms of if you're trying to put your training block in, um, then in the first two weeks, you're probably going to get better power output uh, from your, from not only from your the carbohydrate that you're consuming, but also in terms of your carbohydrate that you're burning. Um, and in the second half, um, that may be actually beneficial for you to um, look at moving into a more of a kind of a fat loss phase. Um, uh, the reason being is that you mobilize fatty acids um, more efficiently. Uh, so. All right. Shall yeah. we cover some listener questions quickly? I think so. I think so. All right. Uh, we have we have three questions this time. I don't think any of them will take particularly long to answer. Um, first question is uh, reads: My question on carbohydrates is about sports drinks and sugar with activity. In my mind, when you eat sugar, there is a risk of reactive hypoglycemia or a collapse of energy after a quick increase. Sports drinks often contain sugars like sucrose, maltodextrin, dextrose, etc. Are these good? What do you think about products containing glucose, fructose syrup? syrup? Uh, that comes from R. Um, do you want to lead off, Tom? Uh, yeah. So I think we've—I mean—we've covered in terms of uh, the health sides of things in terms of glucto glucose, fructose. Um, just briefly. So if you remember early on, I mentioned that actually a mix of glucose and fructose is beneficial because you can absorb the glucose quicker. For climbers, this probably is not going to make that much difference because we're not needing to super load glucose continually like, like you would in a race. In mm -hmm. terms of the hyperglycemia, so this is interesting. This also tends to be from person, person to person. The main thing is, is that what we're looking at is that if you are to dump a lot of very easily digested um, carbohydrate into the, uh, um, if you were to consume easily digested carbohydrate, you flood the blood with glucose much quicker than if you were to consume a more complex carbohydrate. So if you were to drink uh, a glass of, um, well, if you were to just drink a glass of table sugar, right, you'll break that down incredibly quickly because they are basically just fructose and, and glucose joined together to form sucrose. Mm -hmm. And so your blood sugar can rise very rapidly. Insulin gets released to deal with that. But what often happens is that there is a kind of too much insulin is released and you will dip, your blood sugar will then dip lower as the insulin is now pushing it into tissues. 
Right. Your body expects based on what food is usually like for a slower carb release. So it puts out enough insulin for that, but then it's all, all the sugars there and you end up with lower blood sugar really rapidly. Um, yeah. But like Tom said, this is uh, certainly this is something that you can only know through personal experience. Not everyone gets reactive hypoglycemia and certainly not everyone's going to experience this under the same scenarios. So you have to know what sort of meals or drinks or foods tend to cause that in yourself and avoid those before you're climbing. Um, as far as like sports drink goes during exercise, I am not aware of scenarios where drinking a sports drink will actually cause hypoglycemia during exercise because you're not necessarily, you don't necessarily have a large insulin release during it. Uh, instead, you're using the, uh, the, the muscular contractions are feeding that, that transporter action on the cell membrane. Uh, so you're just really, you're going to be booing your blood glucose. Um, it's unlikely that you're going to have such a spike of insulin that it'll drop it down below a normal level. Yeah, and also this pushes on the point of, of, of the types of carbohydrates you're eating. Re refined carbohydrates would increase your blood glucose. This is the glycemia index or uh, insulin index as well, um, which we'll talk about probably in the dieting one. Um, mm -hmm. well, I'll, I'll, I've got some notes on so considerations for diabetic individuals. Now, I need to make clear that this is not medical advice. Brian and I are not providing any medical advice. This is just some opinion that I have, I've taken from a paper. So if you have any questions about uh, if you do have diabetes, uh, you need to speak to um, uh, a, a either a professional uh, a clinic, clinical nutritionist in your area. Um, but uh, just in a general sense, what we're looking at from the data is that actually hyperglycemia or low blood glucose is better managed if you are to exercise in what they call the mid postprandial period. So that's basically roughly 30 to 90, well, sorry, between after 30 minutes, sorry, 30 minutes after you've eaten and before 90 minutes are up. So what we're talking about is that basically you start your training in a period where the glucose has time to start coming into your system. And what you're doing is that you are, like Brian just said, you are now buffering the extra glucose now arriving in your bloodstream by the exercise. So 30 minutes after you consume uh, carbohydrate, you can then start exercising. Uh, and then basically 90 minutes later, you should stop. That's what they call the mid, uh, mid postprandial um, uh, uh, period. Right. Uh, so let's move on to question two. <laughs> I would like to hear your views on carb loading, in particular in view of longer tours of medium to high intensity, and perhaps a little in glycogen depletion with low intensity, but yet still longer tools and tours. And that comes from Silke. You want to kick us off again, Tom? <laughs> yeah, so let's look at what did I put down for here? Again, I, I mean, I had a look at this. We don't have any data on this. Do do climbers need to carb load in the traditional sense? So, in the traditional sense, we're looking at uh, either three days of uh, roughly ten grams per kilogram of body weight of carbohydrate, or what new data is showing that basically you can just do about thirty six hours before the event and have between ten and thirteen grams of carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing is, right, is that I don't see any real reason for you to, to do that. I think what would suffice would be to consume the upper level of daily carbohydrate leading and also to be having, you know, this in the recovery day. So say you were to taper down your training for two days and have one recovery day and then bring your carbohydrate up to, let's say, between seven and, and 10 grams per kilogram, uh, uh, you are going to go into your your project well stocked with uh, with glycogen. You're not an endurance athlete in the traditional sense that is going to to be glycogen depleted. Um, right. Uh, let's. What is your part? Second. Yeah. I think. I think. Uh, just my quick thought on that is is basically same as yours. It's glycogen supercompensation. You know, really maximizing your glycogen stores or carb loading before. An event is really important for endurance athletes who are going to be exercising for a long enough period of time that 
they're going to excel, exhaust their stores, and they're not necessarily going to have easy an easy method to consume this exogenous fuel uh, during the race itself. Or even if they are, they're, they're going to burn through that as well. But for a climber, you're just it's unlikely that even for a, a long day of high intensity climbing, it's unlikely that it's going to benefit you in any major way. And with climbing, you have a lot more breaks, even if it's multi pitch. You know, there's going to be periods of time when you're laying or resting. So you have adequate rest time in between to consume normal food, rest, help, you know, start restoring the stores. And it just, it seems very unlikely to me that you will derive any benefit from carb loading. And there could be a, you know, a possible small ne- small downside, which is that you'll gain a little bit of extra weight. Uh, essentially, you'll be carrying your food on your body, all that extra energy on your body instead of, you know, having it on a pack to the side, which, I mean, if you're doing a long multi-day, you're carrying it up with you anyway. So I guess it's kind of neither here nor there. But if you're just bouldering or doing, you know, single pitch routes and you can, you have the ability to not carry your energy with you on your person, then by all means, keep it off to the side. Don't, don't store it in your body beforehand just so that you might get, you know, a little bit more efficiency out of it. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And actually, just a quick quick aside before we go to the next question is um, uh, certainly if you uh, if you're currently eating below what our recommendations are for carbohydrate and you start increasing your carbohydrate, uh, I must warn you, you probably will put on weight. Um, yes, and this could go up. You could go up two kilos of water weight if you really have been eating low carbohydrate for a while. Um, but the, the main thing is, is that if you're providing more uh, um, fuel for power, you're going to be able to increase your workload. So really, right. it's just, to say that just be aware that, yes, if you start increasing your carbohydrate, you probably are going to put on weight. Um, monitor yourself on that. Um, and as well is, uh, yeah, just I think there is, and I've said this to climbers I've worked with, is it would be wise to to uh, to train at this weight of uh, glycogen. Because this is what you're wanting to have. So if you're not used to and you feel that your performance early on uh, by increasing carbohydrate is um, uh, lower because you feel heavier, then the argument would be, one, it will make you stronger because you're lifting more weight and you're going to have better quality and higher volume of training. That's for sure. But also, um, if the weight issue is really a problem, then we, we can look at uh, maybe reducing your body fat through dieting to balance out this, but this that's obviously for another another podcast. Right. All right. Question number three, the final question: What do you think about drinking shakes made from monosaccharides and polysaccharides, such as glucose and isomaltulose? What amounts and timing would you recommend, if any, and for what kind of training? This comes from Tomash. Right. Do you want to do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I think that when we're talking about training hard, and again, we're talking about these multi-hour sessions, there's nothing wrong with drinking shakes or workout drinks or sports drinks or whatever that contain simple sugars in it and uh, these uh, simple polysaccharides such as maltodextrin. But I think that the, the overall context is always in terms of what your total diet looks like. Um, you should never have a shake taking up so many calories with these simple sh- su- uh, simple sugars that you're not getting a normal amount of other otherwise healthy food, uh, like fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and these other sources of carbohydrates. It, it's completely understandable to me. Uh, you know, you don't you don't really want to eat complex foods in the middle of a hard training session. That's not going to increase your performance. At that point, you just want to replenish your fuel and the simple sugars like glucose. And isomaltulose and maltodextrin are great for that, but I wouldn't have them outside the context of training. And even then, I would only have them in the context of a longer training session or a competition. You know, something that is kind of a one-off, and it's not really about what is uh, healthiest long-term, but more about what is going to give you the maximum performance for the scenario. Yeah, and remember, a lot of remember supplements are there for a level of convenience. Uh, as well, right? So, like we've always mm-hmm. said, you know, you should always choose a steak over whey protein. Um, 
And it's the same thing as if you're consuming carbohydrates, consume whole foods because you're going to get a whole bunch of other stuff in there along with it. So as much as, you know, uh, super starch and uh, these different um, type of starchy polymer products are there and, and uh, have great claims, uh, at the end of the day, they're really probably not going to give you much bang for the buck. Um, certainly as a climate, because you, most of these products are, are, are created for the endurance athletes. And if you're looking for a fast digesting, fast, um, effective uh, carbohydrate, then you know you, a, a typical sports drink that you can get is going to provide that anyway. So um, mm -hmm. again, you can experiment with these, but um, and I have as I have personally, just for the sake of understanding whether they work or not. But uh, my my uh, peri workout or peri training carbohydrates are basically uh, a packet of shortbread biscuits. Now it's very uh, low tech, but very, <laughs> um, which actually let's uh, we haven't brought this up at all, um, and it really is. And I think we, uh, you know, just in a general sense, uh, the quality of your carbohydrates. So quite simply, and most people understand that there's a difference between what they would call complex carbohydrates versus simple ones. And, you know, we, we do recommend basically to get your carbohydrates from whole foods um, and, uh, you know, use potatoes, use uh, s squashes, use sweet potatoes, um, mm -hmm. bring in your rice. Uh, maybe people ask the question, what's better, brown rice or white rice? There really isn't that much difference. Uh, brown rice has a little bit more fiber. Uh, that can be beneficial. Um, uh, yeah. Beans, lentils, and legumes and things. Uh, this That's is great. These are great because they provide fiber for your gut bacteria. Personally, mm -hmm. what I do, which might be helpful for some of you, is I want to get fiber, but I don't tend to handle it as well uh, as I would like. So what I actually do is I tend to eat things like beans and lentils in my last meal of the day. Uh, and that way, what happens is that if I if I'm feel gassy or anything that actually uh that's not a problem the next day so th th this gives me a, a way of having these fibers um without it making me feeling bloated throughout the morning if i have it at lunch or something like that um again you need to experiment with foods there's no point like suddenly eating a whole bunch of beans and lentils if you've got a competition the next day um, <laughs> like yeah, it's, it's not good for yeah, you do, do it safe so experiment with foods, but certainly Brian and I would always say focus on real food first. There is such a diversity yep. of carbohydrates out there from fruits and vegetables. You know, go wild on that. Go wild on the colorful threat, the veg. Use that before mm -hmm. you start mucking around with, uh, with um, uh, you know, supplemental carbohydrates. Right. But again, if you have a long training session and you just need a really simple fuel to help you through it, that's the context for that. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Brian, we're, we're just peaking at two, the two hour mark. Do you want to oh, talk? Man. You want to talk? Yeah, about let's, I want to do the study. I want to okay. do the study. If, if, if people have followed us this long, I'm sure that they'll bear with us another five minutes as we, uh, <laughs> as, as we continue to take our training wheels off. You, you know why? I'm, I'm not going to say that we're going to do an hour podcast because maybe we can't. And, and maybe yeah. people listening to this will realize that actually it's probably not worth it. But and I'd, I'd like to talk to you a bit about this on the air after uh, after we talk about the study quick because okay. I Go think it's, uh, it's important. But anyway, the study we looked at this week was a study called Nutritional Considerations for Bouldering by a few researchers, Edward Smith, Ryan Story, and Mayur Ron Chordas. It was really more of a, a review kind of article. It, it wasn't any uh, unique research. They, they weren't looking at one specific group, um, you know, I'm following them, but it had some very interesting insights, stuff that you'll hear Tom and I talk about if you bear with us through all of these podcasts. Uh, one of the, I think, there were a few things that, that stood out to me that I'd like to talk about, and then maybe there's a few things that stood out to you as well, Tom. Yeah. Uh, one, one big point in the paper was that the trainable variables are significantly more important to performance than physique, which is essentially their way of saying things like body fat and total mass are far less important than your training. 
So if you're thinking to yourself, uh, oh, hey, you know, if I want to be a better climber, I just have to lose five pounds of fat. That's the wrong way of looking at it. The right way is saying, oh, if I want to be a better climber, I have to train more. Because training in the end is going to bring you to that next level. And losing body fat alone is not going to do that. Yeah, that's excellent. And carbohydrates are uh, king for this. Yep. Yep. Um, in line of that, they recommended, the, the authors of this paper recommended about five grams per kilogram per day of carbohydrates. Uh, so that's right at the, you know, right in that realm of where Tom and I were suggesting. And then the, the other interesting point that I saw here was they talked about how chronic restriction of calories can be have a significant detrimental effect on your performance. So this is kind of the, the always dieting approach that you see some climbers take where there's, there's no weight low enough that they don't think that they could be a little lighter and perform a little better. And so you enter this very disordered eating pattern where you're constantly reducing your calories and you're just not eating enough. Uh, Tom and I, will certainly be exuberant when we say eating calories is the number one way to improve your performance. You need to fuel what you're doing. And climbing is is a high intensity exercise. It's very calorically demanding. If you're not providing the calories to do that, then you're not going to get as much performance out of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And we'll, you know, we'll talk about maybe there's periodization of, of, uh, of dieting for a specific purpose. But uh, one way to think of it is like is that if you're eating a certain amount of food now and you're and your weight stable and you can produce a lot of workload, keep going with the workload and put more food in and mm -hmm. keep increasing your workload and put more food in. Because at the end of the day, if you're dieting down so that you, uh, you know, you look you look like a better climber than you actually are. Yeah, then then you're probably not going to be getting the best out of your training or your climbing sessions. But if you think about it the other way around, that you actually eat enough food and energy to support the, the most training that you can do, you're probably going to look like an athlete. Athletes, in the true sense, don't diet. They just train really hard and they eat a lot. And that's why they look athletic because their bodies are growing and adapting to the training stimulus and the training stimulus right. is increasing and increasing and increasing. Uh, for some reason, and I do believe this, is that in the climbing world, we need to be a little bit more serious about this. This is one of the reasons why we're talking about this uh, in a podcast, because I think we're both passionate about trying to get climbers to start thinking of themselves as athletes and, and uh, treating their climbing as a pro sport, which it is, even if it is just a hobby sport, but you're going to get so much more out of it if you put these things in place and really start thinking that you want to support the increase of your training and your performance rather than skirting the fine edge the whole time. Right. And in line with that caloric restriction, uh, one final thing that I thought was interesting in this study was they said 40% of elite climbers had caloric intakes below 2,500 kilocalories per day. Uh, wow. For context, that's that's really low. Um, my daily caloric intake for maintenance, and maybe I'm a bit heavier than many climbers. I'm about 75 kilograms, but my, I will consume when I'm training at least 3,000 a day, if not more. And I'm definitely not training nearly as hard as some of the elite climbers that I see at the gym. Uh, and I can I can attest to this this low caloric intake just anecdotally because I've spoken to a number of the professional climbers that. Uh, frequent the gym that I go to movement and I, I've talked to some of them and say you know what do you do you you, you, you this, for example this one guy I'm not going to name any names he comes in in the morning does a couple hours of training in the morning he said he has about a cup and a half of rice for lunch that's his lunch and then he'll do a few more hours of training in the afternoon so throughout the day at least five hours of training and the main meal that he's eating is a cup and a half of rice which is just such a tiny amount. <laughs> He's a great climber, but I always wonder how much better some of these pro and elite climbers could be if they actually supported their bodies in the way that every other, not every other, but many other uh, sports, the athletes in those sports do. Yeah, so here's, here's a, contentious, it's a contentious point I'm going to make, and, and I'm going to be shut down, and I'm not, I'm not generalizing here. But I really, I really think that actually one of the reasons why a lot of climbers 
now this is going to be this is going to come across badly i can feel it's going to be bad oh <laughs> the, the reason that there are there are a number of climbers who think they don't need so much carbohydrate i believe is because they're probably not climbing or training hard enough and the point being is that is actually if you support yourself with enough carbohydrate you're going to output so much more training right i have not in all the clients that i've had i have never found someone who eats enough carbohydrate and enough mm -hmm. calories i'm telling you the truth they are always under calories right right tricky. they don't know how much that is that has been my experience as well <laughs> and what's amazing is that as soon as you start bringing the calories up and maybe not just the carbohydrate but in terms of everything coming up the output of the training is better and at the end of the day we want to become better climbers this is the whole point of this podcast is to help you become better and healthier and stronger climbers. Mm -hmm. And I really want to, to say to you guys and girls that experiment, start increasing your carbohydrate up uh, after this podcast. You don't have to jump straight up, but maybe have another meal or put some more carbohydrate in. Put some more carbohydrate in during your training session, you know, your next training session. And just start tapering that carbohydrate up and watch what happens to the amount of recovery the, the, the recovery that you have and the uh, power output and the training output, you'll probably be surprised how good you feel and how hard you can train day by day when you're actually meeting the energy demands. Uh, yeah. I've taken myself from being able to only climb once or twice a week to being able to climb three days in a row without much of a decrement in my, in my performance, right? Now, I'm not a pro climber. I'm a hobby climber. So how I measure performance is relative to my own sense but there's no ways that i'd be able to climb friday saturday and sunday of a similar amount of workload if i was not eating i mean the the previous weekend i topped roundly about five thousand calories on the saturday night or not just in one meal but over the saturday mm -hmm. in preparation for what i wanted to do with some guys on the sunday and it helped i could climb at the same level bar my fingers were a little bit twingly but in terms of power output i had that had that there because i was eating enough um, yeah, now, I don't think that's a contentious statement at all. The bottom line is you can only be aware of your own experience and how it's been so far. So to use kind of a strange metaphor, if you had no color vision, if you saw everything in black and white, that would seem very normal to you. And if there was a way that you could develop color vision as somebody who sees only in black and white, then that would seem very different. So these climbers who are consuming very low amounts, they probably feel like they're training very hard, and they are for the, the amount of fuel they have. Uh, they probably feel like they're training at their overall maximum and that there's not anything that they can do to train harder. But as Tom said, it's very possible that if they just added more carbohydrates in their diet, specifically calories in a general sense, but carbohydrates specifically, that they could train even harder. And if they keep increasing it up, eventually you're going to find a hard line. It's This isn't, you know... It just doesn't ascend all the way into the heavens. You can't eat 2,000 grams of carbohydrates and just continue to experience benefits. But certainly the amount of calories and carbohydrates that people that uh, many climbers consume currently is not supportive of their training habits. And they can increase it to a level where eventually they'll continue maintaining weight. They're not mm -hmm. going to start gaining muscle or start gaining fat. But what they will experience is an increase in their training intensity, how hard they can train, how long they can train, how quickly they recover, which is going to influence how many days in a row they can climb, and maybe get that much more training in a period of time. But they'll never know that that is actually their upper limit until they try this. Yeah. Brian, I think that's a fantastic uh, thing to end on. Um, yeah. I don't know if you, so, want, you want to talk about stuff on air. How how did we do? <laughs> what's what's our total time, Tom? Okay, so we have a total time of two hours and seven minutes. Two hours and seven minutes. So that's uh, about a half an hour worse, if you want to consider time as the judge, than we did last episode when we promised everybody that we were going to do better. But I, I think we did do better. We went over time, but last episode. We skipped around on topics and we cut so much out because we both realized in the process of making the episode of recording it that there was just too much for us to cover. 
And we really didn't cut anything out on this one. We covered everything we wanted to cover. And yes, it took us a half an hour longer to do that. But this is, I think, a much better point to go from in the future. Because now we know what a two-hour long episode looks like in terms of content. And if we want to keep making two-hour long episodes, I'm actually okay with that at this point. If we want to just warn people in advance, or if we want to make them hour-long episodes, then we know that we have to cut the content roughly in half. Sure. And we'll spread so, it over, over two episodes. I mean, to be honest, if people want to listen, uh, you know, you listen to half of it and uh, <laughs> listen to the next half the next day. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, please, please give us feedback. Um, uh, yeah, tell us, tell us what you want. Um, we are more than happy to continue trying to slim our episodes down. <laughs> or if this is agreeable to you, if you don't mind listening to me and Tom's voice for two hours or breaking it into a couple sessions, um, but having longer overall episodes, please let us know that as well. Great. Cool. So uh, you can find Brian at climbingnutrition.com, which really is the one stop for uh, climbing nutrition. Um, and, you know, Brian, Brian has, has many articles covering everything from uh, food to supplements to, to training. So I really, I really uh, think it'd be worthwhile looking at that. The only thing I can really contribute is uh, I'm tending to be a little bit more active on Instagram nowadays with uh, <laughs> and studies and things. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any ab shots or anything like that, but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you can find, uh, you can find me on uh, um, uh, at, at useful coach, one word, um, uh, actually, there'll be a good, uh, if you're listening to this podcast, there's a good graph on um, uh, energy, the contribution of the different energy uh, systems. That's my latest tweet today. Um, oh, perfect. So, yeah, have a look at that. I've actually, I've got an article myself coming out. Uh, I was going to release it today, but <laughs> I have to do a little bit more editing. So early next week, same, same kind of consideration. I'm going to have some graphs that I've created to help people visualize how the energy systems work together. Fantastic. Cool. Well, Brian, it is uh, 11 o'clock tonight here in the, in the UK. Um, All right. So I'm going to head home and have something. Cool down. So, well, it was a pleasure talking with you again, Tom. Thank you to everyone who has been listening in. And yeah, we will see you next time on Climb Sci. Thanks, guys. Cheers. <laughs>